Hello, and welcome to the Comics Alliance podcast, presented by ComicsAlliance.com, your source for comic book entertainment culture, news, humor, and commentary. I'm Andy Corey, Senior Editor of ComicsAlliance.com. In this week's episode, we'll talk about the increasingly well-populated landscape of television series based on comic books, our impressions of specific projects, and what, if any, effect these developments may have on the comic book business itself. Later, we'll talk about the latest with Comixology, since the digital comics leader was acquired by Amazon.com. Specifically, we'll discuss the consequences of its controversial removal of in-app purchases from Apple's iOS platform. Joining me this week is the host of the Let's Talk Comics podcast, James Viscardi, Wired Entertainment writer and former Comics Alliance editor-in-chief, Laura Hudson, and fellow Comics Alliance senior editor, Caleb Goldner. To talk about all the new comic book TV shows, I'm joined today by my fellow senior editor at Comics Alliance, Caleb Golner. Ahoy. And our special guest is James Viscardi, host of the fabulous Let's Talk Comics creator interview podcast and former Marvel PR guru. Hi, James. Hello. So guys, at a quick count I did just before we started recording, here's the landscape of comic book-based TV shows at present and in the future. We have Arrow, The Walking Dead, The Flash, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, Gotham, Constantine, iZombie, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, Preacher, Pax Romana, Letter 44, and Ronin. Am I forgetting anything? Yeah, I, no, lost, holy I lost count. I was trying to count them on like my fingers while you were going through, and I just was like, that's like 20 freaking shows. That's a ton. That's, that's two. That's more, almost more than two superhero shows for every day of the week. Well, they're not all superheroes, but there's a lot of superheroes. Well, sure. right, but but com- but like okay, but comic related yeah. shows for every day of the week. Now, what I'm wondering is like, well, this is remarkable in the context of comics, in the sense that you know this material, which has been traditionally sort of relatively cult, is now going to one of the biggest uh, you know communications mediums we have in you know the world, television. But Is it right to think about this as sort of a genre, you know, golden age or revolution? Like, for example, there are who knows how many cop and lawyer shows on television, you know, right. That's not remarkable in and of itself. So, I mean, what do we, I I feel like this has the potential to be the nineties for comic book TV shows. Like they just all came out of nowhere. And if a lot of them are terrible, then uh, then we're going to see a giant... Well, then we'll see a burst. And then we'll get nothing. And we will be punished for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think these shows will be a little bit better than like Nightman and uh, Mutant <laughs> X. So I think, I think we'll be... Able, these, these are bigger budget um, shows and presumably... Way. I, mean, I don't know. I watch Arrow and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I wouldn't say yeah. these are bigger budget. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's interesting that um, Marvel's second network show is another agent show. They seem to really believe in this um, sort of shield apparatus, you know, which has been dismantled. So it's, that's kind of interesting. Well, actually, I would say, if anything, P- Agent Carter is a show built for ABC. Like that, I think if anything, like that is a an example of where a network and a show, I think, sort of go hand in hand. Um, but I think we, sh- we should also sort of be fair to say, and this is not sort of Marvel bias or whatever, but the three uh, Netflix shows that Marvel is doing, um, I don't necessarily know if I, I would consider them TV shows uh, because, I mean, for one, they're primarily going to debut on the internet. They'll be watched on televisions, but they'll, they'll debut on the internet. And just in the delivery of them, uh, I think that they're going to be received and consumed much differently than the traditional sort of week to week. So, uh, more like, stuff. 
more like the newest season of Arrested Development, like a binge watch. It's more like a prestige format movie experience that happens to be episodic. Right. I mean, like you said, you look at like people were, I mean, there was a fever pitch for House of Cards season two, right? I don't think I, I don't know anyone who was ready for House of Cards season two to spend more than maybe a week watching the entire thing. It's interesting that there'll be Marvel shows on network and on Netflix. And yes. Presumably, you know, taking place in the same sort of story universe. Don't worry. But no, but but it's and but the on on the on the flip side, like you just say that you know it all takes place in the same sort of world, we're going to get three superhero-ish DC shows that have nothing to do with each other. Or I guess well I guess, no, I guess Flash and Arrow will be related, but Gotham will sit on its own in its own little world, right? Yeah, and it's it's even on a different network and all these shows will be uh, you know, separate things kind of i mean like they could even take another direction with flash and just be like well it was kind of like a preview in the Arrowverse. this is a new show i don't think they'll do that but i mean they right. could well it's already been established that flash exists in the arrow world though right yeah 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 because yeah, grant uh, yeah because grant got some showed up yeah right all that biz i think it's another question about all this stuff is because the prevailing question on the minds of everyone involved in the comic book business is how can we get more people reading comics? Are these TV shows going to get more people reading comics? I'm not so sure. I don't think so. I don't think the movies did. And those movie, like the Avengers set like a world record. Is it one of the highest grossing films of all time? I love, I, I actually really enjoy Arrow. I wish there was a book like Arrow. I would read a book like Arrow. And I, to some extent, you can say the Green Arrow book is sort of like it. But, but, yeah. but well, I, you know, <laughs> tangentially, sure. I guess. But it's weird because, you know, there isn't a book that feature the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. other than Coulson, who shows up, you know, in, in Secret Avengers and a few other books. Um, and, I, and, and it could just be, be because they're not ready for that universe or that team necessarily or stories for that team to expand just yet because theoretically what what you would want is for it all to matter right because that's all we as comic fans care about that you know they're connected and matter uh and so if you tell a story in uh a comic that relate to those characters you would want it to sort of reflect something that shows up in the show like i think like that ambitious dark tower project that's looming um where like the TV, like it was going to be a TV show that led into a movie that went back into a TV show. Like if you threw a comic component into that, that could be a lot of fun. And I think that would drive a lot more people to reading books. But I think that's a much more ambitious project than anyone may think it would be. Yeah, I mean, just uh, production schedules alone, are, right. in, in comics and, and television is so different. Like it's so much quicker to make a comic book than... Right. And even still, like, show. but even still, if you were to do like a, a series in between, uh, you know, seasons, you would still have to write out or know what's essentially going to happen uh-huh. ahead in the next season of the TV show and still have the time to essentially put the comic together. And you would just need to know that, like, just way far out in advance. I think that's one of the only, I don't necessarily, I don't really watch Walking Dead, but I think that's one of the things that, a, lends itself more to people wanting to go check out the comic is because the characters are mostly the same and they're in the early, you know, parts of the show. There were very much, you know, it was a very good translation from page to screen. Um, that is true. That is, that is a TV show that has driven a ton of comic sales and there's a lot of reasons for it. Yes. Uh, um, Another interest, another reason I think that the Walking Dead television show drives comic book sales is because The Walking Dead is a very easy comic to buy. It's if you want to buy it in periodicals, there's one book. They're numbered very clearly. There's paperbacks. There's hardcovers, and it's all just one thing available in different, you know, form factors for whatever you want to, however you'd like to ingest it. Whereas with Avengers comics, for example, you are just you know, good luck. I, I'm going to play devil's advocate 
for a second and say it doesn't, I would argue against that point because if I was someone who was watching walking dead and saw something go on, uh, I'd want to jump right to where in the comics where that event happened. And then, because then it's going to like, let's say I jump into, uh, you know, volume one, uh, it's going to take you, it's going to take you a bit of time to either maybe catch up with the show or catch up to where it is and i think even still like what walking dead's on like volume 20 something that's a big investment <laughs> um just buying the trades alone that i think could potentially hurt someone necessarily wanting to check it out like there's a lot of story to catch up on sorry to interrupt um oh, we have a, we have a late arrival Laura, you're talking to me and Caleb and James Viscardi. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey, Laura. Laura, we were just saying that The Walking Dead has success driving comic book sales, um, whereas other, you know, for example, Marvel and DC films and, and animations and so forth don't seem to. And I was saying, I think The Walking Dead drives sales because that book is easy to buy because it's just one series clearly numbered it comes in different form factors for whatever you want and other the other things are very you know we know how many avengers books there are there are so many batman books uh but james is james is saying that as a viewer he would want to jump into the storyline um and and i suppose like cheat a little bit like jump ahead right Right. Well, well, I don't think that it exactly works in that way because, you know, I think particularly this season, um, you know, we've and in, in, in previous seasons, we've seen a lot more divergence from the books. Right. You know, they really do kind of operate in different timelines. I mean, I do think that you're right, Andy, and I think it's a, it's a, a long uh, commented upon phenomenon that we've seen also with movies. You know, there's a reason that 300 saw a lot of sell-through from the films uh, in the way that, you know, say the Spider-Man movies did not. And I, you know, I mean, from personal experience working in comic stores, a lot of people come in and they want a single thing that they can buy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to put, you know, a single graphic novel or even the first volume of a single series in someone's hands in a way that trying to navigate through them, through the complexities of, of multiple timelines and titles uh, in a shared universe just isn't. Right. Well, I think what we were what we were saying was that Walking Dead, when it started, it was a lot easier to someone watching the first season to hand them the first trade because there were a lot of similarities uh, between the two. Um, and I think if you know you were to give someone jumping in and telling them where to go, uh, when, when the comic series and the TV shows go their separate ways. How do you explain that to someone who just picked up Walking Dead the comic for the first time? Well, but when someone picks show. up when someone picks up Walking Dead the comic for the first time, they're starting with volume one. And I right. think that's always going to be an easier starting point. It's always going to be an easier sell because it does actually align uh, pretty closely. Right. Uh, so you're always going to have that starting point, and then you're going to sort of organically see them diverge. But I also think that there's something that is of interest uh, to people who get into The Walking Dead about that. You know, I see it a lot with Game of Thrones, which I write yeah. a lot about, um, and particularly about the way that we see those adaptations diverge and why they diverge and, and the ways in which that can sometimes make the story uh, more interesting, or at least to super fans, you know, that they want to kind of delve into that and see why and how those differences exist. So I think when you get down the line, they're, you know, not for everybody. If you want a perfect adaptation, it's not going to be that. But I do think that it, it can potentially be something very interesting uh, to people who are into The Walking Dead. But if the TV show goes in one direction and you like the TV show more, will that hurt that person continuing on with the comic? I'm, I think, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just sort of having trouble wrapping my head around this question because I don't know who expects, I mean, it's not really a new thing that source material is different than the filmed material. No, but the source material is usually finite. You mean, for example, like the Da Vinci, a, the da Vinci yeah. Code book is different than the Da Vinci Code movie. Right. So, I. I'm There's so, an end. There's an end in right. sight. You know I, what the end looks like, and so whatever it changes necessarily changes the ongoing nature and consumption habit of, you know, the enjoyment of it. 
But I think there's also an assumption that you're making there that it's going to diverge, you know, so wildly that it it bears no relationship to what's happening in the books. Uh, and that's not something that we have seen happen yet. Right. But I think the, what we were sort of getting at is that there there's nothing – Walking Dead does it well, right? And But there's nothing necessarily on the flip side with, you know, the, the – cape shows and comics that you can get into. Like the analogy I made was there's no, if you wanted to see more uh, agents of shield stories between seasons, uh, there's really nowhere to go. Or if you wanted to uh, play more in the world of uh, arrow, I mean, you've got the, they have the arrow comic, but if you wanted to read more, Green Arrow stuff, um, you know, you go into it knowing that it's quite a bit different. I'm sorry. So what's the, no, um, (laughs) I I, I guess I don't understand what is, what is, what is the extended analogy there that we aren't going to see that type of sell through with the Marvel television shows or, well, I mean, you know, I think one thing that's going to be interesting to see is, you know, if there's how Alias is dealt with, uh, because that is something that had a very finite run. Uh, And, you know, I think it certainly remains to be seen how closely they're going to adhere to that particular storyline. But it is also something that represents a much more finite uh, physical product uh, relating to this one property than many of the other shows. So I would be very curious to see how sales might potentially uh, differ for that show as opposed to other shows. Yeah, I, I just want him to cast Jennifer Garner and just ruin everyone's <laughs> life. I, I just want him to do that. She was Electra and also on a show called Alias. Oh, what? Oh. That's actually, I mean, this is this is a slight divergence, but that's one of the things I'm enjoying. I mean, it's one thing I enjoy about uh, The Americans, uh, that show, which uh, stars uh, Carrie Russell of Felicity. Uh, when J.J. Uh, Abrams first pitched uh, Alias, he pitched it as, what if Felicity were a spy? And now on The Americans, she is. It's just one of those little ironies that I've always appreciated. There's Is there um, anything else to be said about just the sheer number of comic books that are becoming television shows? Is it... One of the things, the questions we asked earlier, Laura, was, is there any value in sort of contemplating this as a sort of genre phenomenon, or is it just sort of incidental, like how many cop and lawyer shows there are on television? I mean, in in terms of the superhero genre is is, is becoming a a sustainable genre that is just sort of an entrenched part of culture at this point? I think, well, yeah, I think that's a a good observation. Um, (laughs) Is I. I guess I'm trying to trying to figure out like how remarkable this is because it's being talked about a lot like it's remarkable and I'm wondering if, if a majority of them are terrible will that poison the well? Oh well, yes, because we know we know that when uh, for example a movie starring a woman superhero doesn't do well, there are no more women superhero movies. <laughs> so. You know, but I, I think we've seen ups and downs for for other genres as well. You know, Western uh, films, Western TV shows have certainly had heydays when they became more popular and then were less popular. Um, you know, but I, I think that there are probably core genres, you know, that are sort of never that I, that I guess are considered a basic part of media at this point in our culture. Um, and I, I guess I am curious to see if superheroes have truly become an enduring part of that. I mean, it's interesting because when you look at comics um, as a medium, you know, comics, and we we see this certainly in, you know, uh, Japanese comics and manga where they really run the gamut and you have romance and drama and mystery, uh, whereas in America, they're so dominated by this one particular genre in like a way that's kind of weird, uh, especially when you compare it to broader media where, you know, superheroes historically haven't had uh, that strong of a presence. And it's kind of interesting to see it start to have more of a presence. But I, I think that you're right. I think uh, I think particularly among comics fans, there's this feeling of, like, can this last? Like, is this, you know, like, is 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 their love real? Um, is it is it going to be something that endures? Um, I, I'd like to think so, but I guess, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. There is, I don't know, you know, I have this sense sometimes where it's like, have we reached peak superhero? You know, is there going to be a point at which that kind of burns out, especially when you are talking about moving down the ladder through some of these, you know, less than A-list heroes where it stops being about 
Spider-Man and Batman and, and characters with that type of name recognition. And it starts moving into lower tier characters or even, you know, potentially original superhero characters that maybe don't uh, originate in the Marvel and DC universe. You know, how will audiences react to that? Uh, and I am I am curious to see what happens. With respect to uh, your question about other non-Marvel DC superheroes doing well, I suspect they won't because they don't in comics. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people have... Well, a- I mean, just look at shows like The Tomorrow People and, um, you know, even Almost Human, which not necessarily, you know, a superhero show, but shows that theoretically could be comics not necessarily catching on. But is that just because it's a bad show or is it, you know, it's not it's a bad show, not a bad concept? You know. I don't know. Um, yeah. But I think when it comes to the sort of the masked crime fighter genre, I think I think the Marvel and DC icons will always dominate that. But another point I wanted to bring up was this phenomenon that we've seen over the last 10 years or so of people being accused of creating comic books that are designed to basically be television pitches or movie pitches um, as a sort of shortcut or bait for those kinds of things. Like Mark Miller is accused of that constantly. But no, if, Mark Miller. If you, look at the, if you look at the list of shows that are being made, they're all um, very distinctive comic books. Um, and some from comics that have been canceled already. <laughs> yeah. Like, like for example, uh, iZombie is a very like distinctive comic book. Um, it, when you read that comic you don't think, oh, this is just someone trying to make a TV show. Well, here it is as a TV show. Ronin, Pax Romana, Preacher, uh, superheroes like Iron Fist and The Flash. You know, the things that are, that, are, that are ending up on television are not these sort of genre pastiches and, and uh, you know, any number of, you know, they're typically creator-owned sort of uh, elevator pitch comics. I you mean, know, we don't need to name them. We all kind of know what they are. And those aren't happening. What's happening are these very uh, distinctive, even acclaimed comics are coming to the screen. Yeah. I, I, Laura mentioned manga, anime, and I think what's happening, like people talk about peak geek. I think maybe something will happen with Cape comics, but the narrative as far as like comic to TV show to animation to movie to whatever has become kind of similar to the way it happens in Japan. Like, a manga is successful and it'll be like a year or two and then it'll become an anime and it will sell more manga or it'll become a live action show or it'll become a movie. And it just kind of goes on forever. If the franchise is popular. Um, I think that's starting to happen here. I mean, just like the way we cover it as the media, it's no longer, wow, can you believe it? It's just like, yeah, so this is happening. Uh, you know, cause this is every day now, this is every week now. Um, I mean, like when I, when I first started this career, I guess there were websites that were devoted to covering nothing but comic books being adapted into other media. A lot of those sites have gone away and now it's just a news item in variety that only mentions the fact that something is a comic book almost in passing. Um, so it's almost become like, a, a, a just a fact, like a matter of fact, uh, part of of media now which i think is potentially good and bad um i think it's it's kind of fun but um at the same time will people just take for granted that things are comics moving forward i mean i i think that's a really great observation about japan and about manga and about how that industry works um you know and i, I there is no stigma uh, to creating a manga and have it having it translated into into anime or into 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 an animated film in any way but the the big difference that i would notice that you know economically uh that industry works very different than ours in in terms of prestige as well you know people who make comics are respected there uh, and they can make money in a way like the industry is just economically larger uh, than it is here, I think it's seen as less less of a niche industry, you know. And I, I think that the financial motivations and realities end up being really different in American comics uh, than they are in Japan, uh, in ways that I think are are detrimental to American comics. Well, that's what I was trying to say before about the television shows: is that all these books that we see that are plainly 
elevator pitches for films and television shows. Those aren't the books getting made into TV shows. The ones that are getting made are the ones that are very uh, cool or at least very distinctive that you wouldn't guess would make good TV shows like The Flash and Iron Fist and Preacher and Pax Romana, you know, like th- these letter, are letter 44 might be kind of on that TV pitch type of comic because it like, you know, got made into a show and it's only in its like third issue. <laughs> so, okay. But th- th- there's a few, but I think by and large, you're totally right. I think, uh, I think I've said this before and like, sometimes I know it sounds like I'm full of shit, but I think coolness is the only currency that matters in like modern entertainment. Like, whether or not your book is good isn't as important as if it's cool. Like I happen to believe that a good book is a cool book. So like, I don't even know how the hell to explain the walking dead other than that. It's a bulletproof concept. It's a zombie drama, which, you know, 28 days later proved was this amazing thing that people loved. So like there's, there's, there's a kind of genius there, but like, you know, that book has a lot of problems and that show has a lot of problems. But yeah, I mean, like, I think it is cool. Like the flash, the flash is wearing skinny jeans in his costume. That's like really weird and funny to me. And I, I think it'll be funny on TV. Uh, and you know, like I zombie could be a good show. It stars a former power ranger. So that's already got that going for it for me. Uh, but yeah, like having, having, having a cool comic will always equal having a cool adaptation, at least on paper. I do worry about peak geek, but I don't worry about it for stories and comics that aren't from the big two. Um, I think, I think I said this to you, Andy, I think Avengers two is going to be like the ultimate test of the Marvel cinematic universe. I think agents of shield was already kind of a strike against like, can they keep this cool and exciting? And no, they made a TV show for my mom and my dad, you know, God yeah. bless them. They love that show. I think that show is unwatchable. It's like, I've seen a lot of shows where people hide behind walls with guns, you know, like, what is this show? I don't know what it is. Um, but you know, in Avengers 2, it's going to create this universe. They, they're adding like six new characters for this movie. Some are heroes, some are villains. Some may or may not be related to Magneto with another studio owns. Like, they're Inhumans? What's an Inhuman? There are more aliens? There's Guardians of the Galaxy now? Like, it's going to get complicated, and actors are going to start leaving. And an actor leaving a, leaving the cinematic universe? You know, Robert Downey Jr., he's, he's getting up there, and he's kind of sick of it, you know, he said. Um, and then, you know, Chris Evans, he's only on his second Captain America movie. He's like, yeah, I can't wait to be done with this shit. Um, it, it, it's... An actor leaving a franchise like that, it's never been tested on this scale. Like, no one knows what will happen, but I suspect it'll be like when your favorite creative team leaves a comic and all of a sudden there's a new direction or there's some new artist who doesn't measure up or a new writer that doesn't measure up. Uh, so it, it, it's going to get confusing and it's all of a sudden this Marvel Cinematic Universe that's made a billion bazillion dollars is going to be tested in the same way the comics are. You know, like what matters? What's the most important thing? I have 12 movies to watch this year and 10 TV shows. Like which ones do I have to watch? Because I also would like to sleep at some point or, you know, keep my job. Um, and also it's going to become a question of like, which characters really matter? What, what is the most important takeaway from this plot point? They're going to have to start doing retcons and like all this stuff that comic book fans complain about and hate, they're going to have to start doing in like a couple years. So uh, I'm I, I'm glad I don't have to like have it be my problem. I'm glad I get to sit back and and write about it. Uh, so you're suggesting they're going to be adapting comic books continuity problems. Yeah, no, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to take them on as their own. Um, They've already done that with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I saw that I saw that scene at the end of Cap, and I was like these characters look terrible. Like, uh, the Olsen twin sister is sitting there acting like she's like drunk and like she's playing with blocks magically somehow. And what do you guys think about Gotham being a show about Batman without Batman in it, where uh, alongside of it, there's a flash show. There's a green arrow show. There's going to be a daredevil and Luke Cage and iron fist shows. Um, and they're following this kind of, you know, um, tease 
which they are going to stretch out for like seven years I, it was is their hope you know kind of like smallville um and you know it made sense at the time i suppose why you couldn't have superman in smallville because it's it just really hadn't been done i mean they tried that superman show with terry hatcher and it was bad you know and i don't know man i watched desperate housewives for a full two years just for more terry hatcher in my life so it was a kind of success that has nothing to do with what i'm talking about now you know superheroes are so ubiquitous like what i mean and i mean filmed superheroes people in costumes running around in front of cameras that they have the biggest one the biggest single superhero which i think is batman um, not appearing at all. You know, could this be like a big misstep? Or is the show going to be such a great cop drama, such a great immersive world that we'll like it anyway? I mean, I, I keep thinking back to Smallville, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, Smallville. But that show lasted for 10 years. So. It sure yeah. did. It sure kept on going. And we got a lot of traffic making fun of it. So really, <laughs> if anything, we should welcome all the horrible comic book TV shows that we can um, just for the longevity of our careers. Uh, we are experts in things that are terrible, everyone. Congratulations. Um, it's yeah, true. I, it does make my comic book reading more relevant to a mainstream audience. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cha <Thank> <laughs> ching. I think Gotham, I don't know, man, like, I don't know what to think about that show. I don't like to be too ultra negative before a show airs or I see any of it. Uh, but it's like, I'm not interested just like on a surface level. I'm just, I'm not interested in the concept. Um, I think the closest thing to Gotham that fans got to watch, uh, what was the show? The Birds of Prey show that was on for a couple episodes and it got like a DVD release. That show was kind of the opposite of Gotham. It was kind of a prelude or like a sequel to, to a Batman world. It was like a kind of a post-Batman world. And everybody kept wanting to see Batman show up um, because Batman did exist in that world. He was the, the father of the main character. And, you know, Oracle is on the show. You had actual comic book characters straight from the comics, plus like this tweak to new thing, new character for uh, just the show. Um, and I feel like the 90s and the early 2000s were all about that kind of alternate universe like thing that was the comic and not the comic. It was kind of like a new, it was kind of like Ultimates before the Ultimate universe existed, you know? Uh, and now people are afraid to touch the comics because they got to, you know, I don't know what the deal is with the publishers or the studios, like if they want to keep that prime stuff open for movies or bigger bigger plans and that's why they don't want to touch it or do they not want to touch it because they think that they have power over the audience if they leave that like if they plant the seed they're like we could batman could show up eventually you know and they just keep people hanging on uh, as they pull them through inconsequential story about bruce wayne farting when he's 11 well why is that easier than just <laughs> why is that easier than just making a batman show I don't know. I, I think it might be like a human nature thing. Like, um, I think people are just curious. Like, you know, they're curious from a, maybe even a hate watch perspective. Like, how stupid are they going to make Edward Nigma? You know, like, how weird is this going to be? Um, because there's no fear anymore. Like, if this show gets canceled, it's not like we're never going to see Batman. So, um, I guess like let's hate watch it, you know, like it's like this new phenomenon where it used to be, we got to support this show because if we don't support Smallville, then there'll never be another Superman show. You know, it's like now it's kind of the opposite. Like uh, let's support this show, even though we hate it because, you know, it'll get canceled no matter how many people watch it because of whatever kind of decision. Um, so let's like let's like make a weird party out of all this uh, random aside stuff. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think I think they're going to try to make a good show. Like whatever you think about its conception, but I think they're going to try to make a good Gotham show. I hope so because I like Ben McKenzie from the OC. Man, formative formative teen watching. Uh, what do you think about Gotham, Laura? Um, I'm, I don't know. Jury's still out for me. I mean, I, 
I, I, I think I feel some sort of almost more inherent positive association with it because I feel like I've seen so many more successful live action adaptations of Batman um, and animated as well. I feel like the, the Batman franchise has done pretty well when it comes to adaptations. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of it's going to be in the, in the execution of it. I certainly want it to do well. Um, and it's just hard to tell which way it's, which way it's going to turn, you know, if it's going to turn, uh, towards, I guess the, the, the positive version of it, I imagine in my mind are more towards the Smallville. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. A, a lot of this, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm just kind of going to need to see it before I make judgments about it. Again, my big question about it is with all this other stuff on TV, with the actual heroes running around, is who's going to be like, all right, well, it's time to watch the Batman show without Batman in it and without any villains in it. Like, before the whole pitch is before they were the Riddler, before they were Catwoman, you know? Uh, well, like, and I mean, like, I loved, I loved Gotham Central. I thought that was such an amazing comic, you know, and I thought part of the pleasure of it was, you know, in the context of this, um, in the context of, of all of these other comics where it's just like max superhero all the time, kind of pulling back from that and seeing something a little more ground level was really appealing. I, and in a sense, you know, we've, we've had, you know, I feel like there is maybe not exactly a glut of superhero content in mainstream media, but there's a lot more. And I wonder if potentially there might be, you know, uh, an interest in seeing something like that, something a little more subdued. That, you know, because when Batman showed up in Gotham Central, that was awesome. Like, it really felt exceptional. It felt really, really cool, as opposed to, like, just another episode of, you know, Batman doing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'd love to, if there's a way to convey that in, in like, a cool noir kind of kind of show, I'd be way into that. It's, you know, it's just how well it it carries it off and how much it's able to avoid the Smallville phenomenon of, like, you got to a certain point with Clark, and you just wanted to see him become Superman, and it felt like they were just treading water. And that they weren't allowing the character to grow. And it, it became a really frustrating experience, which is a lot of why I stopped watching that show. But if they can sort of create an environment, you know, and it is, it's it's not the same as a, a coming of age story for a young man. You know, this is, you know, presumably a, about, uh, you know, the experience of, you know, these detectives or this this town. I mean, that is something that I think could potentially go on for a while without feeling like something's being withheld from you. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a give and take. Like, the dynamic you described with Gotham Central uh, existed because that world was already fully formed. Mm-hmm. Uh, worse, worse, the Gotham premise is that this world is not yet formed. And in fact, logically, I think, for Batman to emerge at the end of the narrative, whatever that might be, Gordon and all the other whatever heroes are in the show have to ultimately lose because Batman's a consequence of you know the, the city you know falling apart. Mm-hmm. So so whatever they're the show dramatically speaking, if if we're gonna like think about it logically, would have to be a depiction of you know um, all the heroes losing over the course of the of the how many years it's gonna be. Which is, might be which might be a tough you know dramatic thing for the audience to watch, right? And I mean, but okay, I mean, this isn't this is going to be a completely unfair analogy that like it's, this is going to be a completely unfair analogy, but like so was The Wire, you know, like The Wire was a show about detectives like having some successes, but like ultimately failing and running up against like bullshit and bureaucracy and like frustration and like not getting to serve justice a lot of the time. Um, and it was still super interesting. Comixology made some news last week when just two weeks after being acquired by Amazon.com, updated its iOS app for Apple devices such as the iPhone and iPad 
to remove the in-app purchasing feature whereby users could navigate to comic book products with, within the luxurious iOS um, user interface, uh, pick out things they wanted and buy them with a couple taps right there from within the app. That feature is gone, which... Dun, dun, dun. Yes, which... Um, our last Ruined everyone's weekend. Yeah, they did that on a <laughs> Saturday, which was not fun for those of us who have to cover this stuff and think about it. But uh, on our last episode, Allison Baker of Monkey Brain Comics, which has an exclusive dig- digital distribution deal with Comixology, told us that, to her knowledge, the vast majority of comic book purchases through Comixology were on the iPad through the iTunes sort of apparatus. Now that can no longer happen. It's just simply been shut down, uh, which will have to drive customers to the um, Comixology website, which is and buy things there and then download them to their app, which is how um, iPad Kindle users have had to work for a long time. There are people who are just going to give up on that. And I feel like that's the audience that we need the most is the one that would be the most impacted. Yeah. You got to think Apple is now, because I mean... Uh, it's a probably a significant chunk, I maybe mean, not a significant chunk that they they would be worried, but a significant chunk that Apple is missing. So you've got to assume that they're work like if Apple were to say, "All right, fine, we will work out a deal with the publishers themselves. We'll build a a you know a newsstand slash iBooks app just for comics, and we'll build our own storefront, and then Apple will continue to take the thirty percent, and then the publishers will see more, right?" Um. It's got to be on the road. Perhaps. Um, Comixology reportedly had 200 million downloads since its inception, which, I mean, that might be a drop in the bucket, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of the iTunes app store. But Laura is right. Uh, it's, it's another big barrier. And it, what it does is it just digitized the direct market audience base. The only people who are going to do this are people who are already comic book readers who want to buy their comics digitally, who've been, you know, they're not, they're, it's just the Wednesday crowd online instead of in mm-hmm. the store. Right. And that's, that's a problem if you want to expand the audience, you know? Yeah. And I, I think if, if Apple were to take this on themselves, if they potentially cared enough about it, or if publishers went to them and said, Hey, maybe you should do something about this. The potential, uh, exposure I, I would think would would rival the exposure that the Comixology app used to get, and potentially any exposure that um, Amazon may potentially provide. In the so get on it, Apple. It's hard. It's hard to know. Take what the Amazon, idea. It's free. Yeah, it's hard. Just to, make it easy for me. It's hard to know what Amazon's plans are for Comixology right. now, but there needs well, to be a comic book. There needs to be an iTunes for comics, like there is yes. for music and film. And Comixology was the closest we have, and it has yep. been, you know, crippled and in some way. And yeah. what you mentioned earlier about publishers creating their own stores, like as a reader, any reader, not just me, does not want to go to the Marvel store and then to the DC store, and then to the image store, then the dark horse store, the dynamite store, the fanographic <laughs> store. You want to go to your comic book store and get everything you want. Right. It's like, you don't go to a different grocery store for each different kind of food. <laughs> you know, like I, I understand that, I mean, I've seen some creators, Nick Spencer again comes to mind because he was very vocal <laughs> about this, advocating for like publisher direct in a couple of years. Yep. And I said, that sounds terrible to me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no one, no one wants, you know, creators not to get what's coming to them monetarily. Right. But some people do. <laughs> <laughs> but you, well, can, you can't just, lower sales is lower sales, you know, like right. you can, you can take, 30% of a hundred sales, or you can take 70% of, you know, three sales. Yeah. There is the whole, so Amazon has a product called create space, right? And that is a self publishing platform for people who want to print and sell books of all kind, physical, digital, etc. And comiXology has their comiXology submit. What would be really interesting to see is if Amazon is able to work out a deal with Diamond that say if those people who are creating digital comics want to get print comics out into the marketplace, 
would Comixology print and sell them or through through Amazon? And then Amazon essentially becomes a publisher. That's interesting, but it would only be viable if um, big name creators did it. Because there's already well, I mean, but if, if if Mark Wade took Thrillbent and started to and just started to print it, I mean Yeah. Well Mark Wade is, you know, a name right. creator with, with an audience. <laughs> right. You know, um Diamond Diamond already has trouble selling, you know, um comics from people who, who don't go through the traditional system or who aren't accepted through the traditional system. But I imagine deal, Amazon Amazon would if, have an even bigger objection to it, I think. Well, but if the deal was you know, if creators got enough of a cut, would that then harm the image model? If creators were able to make enough per copy sold and Amazon is willing to eat a printing cost, would they do it? I don't know. It's, I mean, would Amazon take less than image? I kind of doubt that. If you considered Amazon a, just a print, a printer, they may. I don't think. I don't think Amazon's looking for any and potentially any rights at first, but because they don't take any rights off people who are publishing uh, prose books, and you know, and then people who work through that create space system and make a lot of money. Hmm. What do you think, Caleb and Laura? I think a lot of things, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about a lot of them without being like. Well, buy my my comic books and blah blah blah. So well, you should. I, I know. <laughs> because we need some some context, you know. Let's. Well, I am. You can't just I, let James throw that grenade. <laughs> you know? Well, we should mention that, that James right now is working in publishing, so he I has also work in publishing. So I, I I live in this space, and I and it's a you know, I understand. I I work for I work for Ingram, which is a. Distributor for, you know, potential for traditional prose, you know, publishing houses or not necessarily prose, but academic, etc. And so, so the space is very, very, the, what's happening is very, very interesting to me. Um, even just as someone standing on the sidelines seeing what's, what's going on. I mean, to be fair, you know, my, my company is looking to sort of break into to comics for people who are looking for a cheap alternative to print books. Uh, so, but now, you know, with the comicsology being folded into into Amazon and the already strong base of creators publishing you know, work through comicsology submit, it, it could potentially become very, very interesting. It could not. It could go in a completely different direction, and comicsology will just be, you know, something that we all thought was really, really cool ten years down the line. I have so far only sold my comic books through Gumroad, which um, lets you set your own price and all my comics are currently pay what you like for the digital version. I've been, uh, I've been really slow to put my comics anywhere else because I'm worried about what they'll do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, people for the past like two years have been asking me, when are you going to put your stuff on Comixology? And I said, I, for the amount, like, you know, the Comixology submit rules are all up on the, you know, they have like a, a fact sheet. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know if I'll sell more on Comixology because will people even know to look? Um, because my book is so small and self-published. And, you know, I think I'd be better off if somebody would just come and like this book and get it for free digitally and buy it at a con later as in the print version, uh, just to keep things small so I can keep track of it. I don't know if having like an indie book on in the Kindle store on Comixology and on every place you can find it. I don't know if that really means more sales, especially because most of the value to an indie creator is having information about who bought your book. Um, especially if you want to expand things down the road, it's, it's more important to me, uh, to have a database of, of, of a way that I can like talk to people who buy my stuff than maybe getting a, a check from Comixology quarterly if it makes more than a hundred dollars or whatever the stipulation is there. Um, that, that's the other huge thing is how all these services pay out to creators. 
there most of them have a minimum amount of sales that you have to your book has to perform a certain way before you will get paid like you don't they don't say you make less than that cap they're not holding your money hostage per se but you're not going to get it um until you sell more so if you use a service like Gumroad or there's others as well, you get paid, the minimum is like 10 bucks and you have all that information on demand. You don't have to wait for Comixology. I think only tells you your sales monthly. I think if you're on submit, it's a different deal. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like quarterly or something. So I've been really wary of, uh, putting my, my comics anywhere that I can't just see how they're doing all the time. And know how much money they are or aren't making. I would rather have a situation like that where people have to click through three things. Because uh, number one, I know they actually read and liked my book, maybe. Um, and then number two, I don't have to. Wo- I don't have to wonder. Uh, it's just like it's not even worth it right now to me. Caleb, do you have a newsletter? No. <laughs> or do you just or do you just hold on to? Well, no, I just ask like, or do you just hold on to the email addresses? Uh, in, and then, you know, maybe would do something with it when you had something new out. Like, I, I, it, what you just mentioned is actually super interesting, uh, in that it, it, it's sort of like how the indie music scene worked and may continue to work, but even just like a, a couple of years ago where, you know, bands were just getting, and I mean, even yourself, I mean, as a musician, I mean, people were just getting, stuff up and out there and awareness was the the key for some folks not necessarily what they would pay for your work i mean if you made money off it great but the the goal was to get people to like it and tell more people about it right yeah yeah so sites like gumroad do have that kind of newsletter functionality you can contact people who have purchased your stuff and with a simple email um but you know other services don't have that i mean like if things change and comicsology might look like a much, it might be super important for the types of books I'm doing. Um, or if I were at a publisher, of course I would want my stuff on comicsology. I'd want it on the Kindle. I'd want it everywhere, but it, it would mostly be because I didn't have to mess with it myself. Um, you know, what's important to people who make comics is that they have time to make good comics uh, and not have to be running a business per se, like as a big part of their day. So, I mean, like, you know, comicsology, you can't beat it for exposure. Same thing with the Kindle store and other places. But uh, when you know your book isn't a TV pitch or a movie pitch, and maybe it's, you know, it's a little bit away from what publishers are currently looking for. Um, to me, it's just, yeah, it's more like the indie band thing. Like, you're not in a huge rush to get it on these platforms where you don't really have a... Uh, perfect understanding of how things work or how things are going to work. You know, like you're essentially uh, using, using an audience base that you build as essentially a street team. Sure. I mean, control is everything, you know? And when you go with these distributors or whoever, you got to ask yourself, like how important is it to me to lose control? You know? So that's my uh, DIY punk rock buy my comics. (laughs) (laughs) feel i think these services are great though like as a consumer i would rather you know comic book stores for me like i used i i stopped going to a lot of them regularly uh i have like a really great store in portland that i go to and there's a couple that i go to and really like but i stopped being a wednesday guy because comic book stores would close at seven and i would work till practically seven a lot of days i'd be like how do i get in traffic to a store and somebody would always screw up my pull list (laughs) Comicsology was great for that, is still great for that. Um, so I don't want anybody to think that I'm just like saying these are tyrannical overlords that take too much money, man. But um, w- once you do release your comic and you're trying to monetize it, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, is it worth more to me to make 70% myself selling to fewer people? Or, you know, like, is it cool if I make five to 10 cents per, per dollar? putting it on these bigger distributors that might sell more comics they might not so that, that's the indie question right now James Viscardi where can the listeners find you on the internet 
You can find me at Let's Talk It's a little podcast ditty that I do every uh, comes out every Monday where I go one on one with your favorite creators in comics, uh, new, old, uh, retired, not retired. Uh, we just get the history about them, why they got into comics, how they got into comics and what the hell they're still doing in comics. Um, and uh, yeah, it's generally a good long time. They're long. So if you've got a long commute, enjoy them. Uh, but yeah, you can just find me at Let's Talk and on Twitter and Facebook and all that crap. And thank you, Laura Hudson, for joining us today. Where can the listeners find you on the internet? Uh, I write primarily at uh, Wired, which is uh, Wired.com, or you can find me on Twitter at Laura underscore Hudson. That's L-A-U-R-A underscore H-U-D-S-O-N. Caleb Goldner, where can the listeners find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me every day on comicsalliance.com and then also at my two comics, uh, mermaidevolution.com and taskforceradsquad.com. I'm also at, on Twitter at, at Caleb Andrew. And I'm Andy Corey. I can be found every day on comicsalliance.com and on Twitter at Andy Corey. If you don't know how to spell that, it's on the page in front of you.